that lovely work you did at that you had your retrospective. What did you call it? What did you call that? A life in making. A life in the making. Yeah. Not in the making. In making. In oh, in making. Of course, of course. Yes. Right. I finally get it. Okay. Can you start? Yes. Okay. Elizabeth Fells. Thank you so much, Liz, for joining us here yeah, and for coming through to the gorgeous George to chat with me about your life and your work. And I have to credit Open Studios Comedy for the reason why and how I met you. Um, I think the first time I ever saw your work was when I came to interview you yes. at your house in Comedy, didn't I? And I was quite overwhelmed. I couldn't believe there was this like hidden gem. You know, at that stage, I had never heard of you. Anyway, I think I spent quite a long time rummaging around your, your house <laughs> instead of interviewing you that day. But um, what really impacted me about your art more than that was when I went to see your exhibition at the Skin Street Gallery, which was a life in making, which was your entire body of work. Was it 40? How many years worth of work? Um, not uh, maths. I got fourteen percent. Fifty-five so years. Fifty-five yes. years <coughs> of daily practice. <coughs> yes. Um, and the entire exhibition was beautifully summed up by Lucinda Jolly in the Daily Maverick in the most beautiful article. So I'm not going to repeat all of that, but um, it was absolutely mm -hmm. for the words she puts to to describe that you, although your message or your inspiration may have come from biblical teachings and learnings, that wasn't really what the viewer needed to take away. You could take away anything that you felt you got, you got inspired by, and a lot of your family history was also reflected in your art. Um, but I'd like you to tell me what all the genres of work that you cover. Everything. What I, I know we know we can see it's ceramics and needle points, but the paper bag, what else? I would think that I have <coughs> subverted every known craft um, and and uh, pillaged every every primal aspect thereof. Yes. In other words, I did the, the beginner's <coughs> weaving course, auto, four shaft, loom, from Sweden, um, got a spinning wheel, spun my own wool, even from uh, the sheep on the farm where we hired a, a cottage, and um, in a bathing costume like a Peruvian woman would sit with her and spin, yeah. not even a spindle, an ordinary spindle, which I much preferred to the spinning wheel, yeah. and having woven uh, rules and gung and herring bowing and all those wonderful weaving things. I decided I never want to see this again and I gave it to some mission and got an old bed frame with um, bits of, of old tire inner tubes and uh, various other things and wove on that. Wow. And, and so now I'm at coming up 86. Uh, have a whole set of these and if you look at the the picture or the the artwork yes, or whatever you want to call it up there um, <coughs> a lot of the pieces are woven on these teeny little little things which can sit down nicely in the couch and have a large con container full of old yeah. rags wool all kinds of things um, so no more no more tubes so this can I just just to give some context to your background and the reason why we are so honoured to actually have you as part of the falling exhibition. I'm honoured to be here. Thank you, Liz. I am more honoured to have you here, honest, to be honest with you. <laughs> I really am. Um, <coughs> works of yours in public collections, can I just say, you're in the Zico National Gallery, Cape Town, Pretoria Art Museum, Durban Art Gallery, Tatham Gallery in Peter Maritzburg, Schlesinger Collection, the Anglo-American Corporation, the Department of National Education, the Engine Petroleum Collection, Technicon Vartis Run Collection, the Sassel Collection, the University of Stellenbosch Art Gallery, 
the South African Council of Churches. That's just your work in public collections that are accessible by the public to see your work. You are then in an innumerable amount of private collections as well. And then that excludes all the galleries that you've been exhibited in um, from back in the 1980s right up until today. So just to, to give you know, a context to your background, I think you are definitely by far our most accomplished and our most, um, well, recognized artist on this exhibition. So honestly, you bring the whole level of what we're doing here up ten notches and so really it's been such a great pleasure. I did have one artist complaining, why so much Liz Fels? Liz Fels, Liz Fels. <laughs> so I said when you reach Liz's uh, level, you'll also be the main artist please. Anyway, and that was actually just a, a light part of chat. But I'd just like to also go to your paper making and your books. Well I can just say thank you for that because I do feel that that Yes. It, it, you know, God opened the doors for yeah, those yeah. places. It was a time and a season yeah. that, um, you know, mainly white artists were acknowledged. Yeah. And and I think that really to to be there was is is such an honour. Yeah, yeah. Even if I'm in the basement much of the time. Yeah. Um, that that I can really thank God that that those doors were opened and I am happy to pass on to to all these wonderful black artists who are in museums now. Yeah. I mean I have I spent two thousand five hundred on the book on the catalogue for mm -hmm. the Jackson Shlongwani exhibition which I kept saying where's the catalogue, where's the catalogue? I thought, thought I had to buy it by yeah. that time. Because I think that that, I mean, he has been slightly overlooked all these Sorry years. about the background noise. He is our most, our most wonderful um, sculptor in Africa. Jackson Shlongwani, yes. Jackson Shlongwani's yeah. working of that wood with those tools yeah. and the, the motive behind it. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was blessed to be able to hear him speak mm. uh, when... Oh, and the very first time, I think it was Ricky Burnett had a, a thing at BMW or mm. somewhere where he talked. And I was smitten. I mean, he was hilarious because we were talking to the, the very Gucci bagged um, people from, mm. from the, 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 um, the art museum in, in Johannesburg. Mm. You know, the friends of the but art those, gallery. But those Gucci bagged people are the ones that speak on art and invest in our South African artists. Absolutely. So we, we, no. we love them and appreciate them. Absolutely yeah. love them. Yeah. But, but but the thing is there, I mean, Jackson Shlongwani is sitting next to his fire with showing us his, his festering leg was not quite what they had expected to come to see. Yeah, but at least authentic. It was least totally authentic. authentic. Mm. And mm. and he got, he got um, his first exposure there. Mm. So I'm glad to have been there. Liz, a lot of your work is uh, references your family, your children, your backgrounds, uh, your grandchildren, and in a lot of your paper making, which yeah. you make yourself, which you've got some of your books here, you actually bring back together, besides your reference to the book, I call the Bible the book, and the prophets and all of that, you also have a lot of uh, context about your grandchildren and you were just showing me this little booklet that you made yourself and just open it up completely so that people can see you know Liz has made the paper herself and then she's incorporated the grandchildren's drawings into the artwork you can explain a little bit of it Liz. well this this is a very primitive I, I did proper book binding one of the crafts I had I did was with Peter Carstens for years and years I went to his evening class and so um, I did do uh, one or two leather bound sewn on on uh, cords all beautifully traditionally made yes. and decided like the weaving uh, I, I was not going to be doing that 
Yeah. So a lot of alternate kinds of uh, book you, binding. You, you handle ones. these things very roughly. I well, feel this, like they need to be carried around with white gloves. Well, um, yes, it only, only and some keepers to get that, <laughs> even if they've burnt or lead. Yeah. So, so they're tiny little drawings from the very late, the last grandchildren I'm likely to have, um, who are now in university, uh, preschool drawings. Sometimes they were just, uh, I, have, I have integrated into them. They came down to me, and so one of the older ones did them arriving by aeroplane all these little people with their names attached to them. Um, and so these are it's a by the sea. Yeah, it's this beautiful. by the sea. And and this this system I've used very often. Not quite so So what is it? Is it stitched or is there latex? So how did you make it bound? This is this is bound um, pamphlet stitch bound and then adhered uh, so, so each of these two would be a page and a page, stitched together, and then stitched, stitched together. So even the, the binding is paper? Everything is paper. This, this, these are not necessarily <coughs> all, uh, these are collages, collages more than, than handmade paper. Um, <coughs> I, did, I, did, uh, I did make whole, whole handmade paper books in one for my, for my mother and one for my, my mother. This is for your grandmother or your mother? My mother. This is for my mother. Yes. And, and my father was a doctor killed in the war. So, so I didn't know him until I was four years old. And this is really about to retrieve the history okay. um, for me. This is part of, part of a, a discourse I did for my my uh, master's technicum which they allowed me to to do and this one was for my for my grandmother who was a very pivotal figure in my life um and yeah my grandfather's name was nathaniel and in the bible nathaniel was one of the disciples called by jesus who had sort of seen him under a fig tree so the whole the whole symbol of the thing. is that is the fit of the fig tree. <coughs> which I, I pressed into the paper and then um, retouched. So, so Liz, that's what the, while you're showing us your books, would I be able to teach you to read us a poem from one of your books? Well, let's see. Let's get the short of one somewhere. <clears throat> I mean, seeing as you're a poet as well, yeah, as a ceramicist, um, little, little poetry in group. every genre of art is unbelievable. Uh, Right, this, this is a, probably the shortest one, called Birth. And this is my eldest daughter, got my younger daughter here, youngest daughter. And um, so she was the first birth I deal with. And, and this one perhaps is autobiographical, it's simply called Birth. And, and then as, as she was knitting, their drawings came from obviously much later, same person. Same little baby, birth, down, heave, and sweat, blood corded to my gut, you came, flesh of my flesh. Behold, I have given you upon the face of all the earth, groping, grasping, life leached to my breast, you hung, mine, no, thine. Amazing. I love it. I love it. And I'm assuming that thy means our children belong to God. Yes. Ultimately, you've got to give them back. <laughs> yes, you do. You do. And Which I is the good news, actually. Yeah. You do awesome. not want them at 50 still staying at home. <laughs> not even at 30. <laughs> that's, that's true. So, um, Liz, is there anything that you would really say to a young person and a young emerging artist that's struggling to find a place of recognition and a place of <coughs> acknowledgement, just talking to try and sort of pole vault or catapult themselves into being accepted in, in the world of art because it, it does involve a lot of closed circles. You know, it's very difficult. Uh, you study art, but a lot of people that didn't maybe 
study aren't already in that inner circle of Michaelis or the Wits Art School. Is there any advice you'd give a young person that really has aspirations? Um, where could they start? How would you get into a gallery? Or should you link up with a group of artists? Any advice on that? I don't know. For me, I think that you have to have a passion for making. Yes. You have to have a passion, whether it sells or not. You have to have a certain um, stickability. Yeah. I mean, Kathy and I have just been to the Van Gogh Museum. Now that is four stories of Van Gogh. Yeah. In the last year, he did a painting every day. Yeah. From the asylum. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it, it's is, like it, it didn't sell me, but it's heartbreaking. It's yeah. heartbreaking, but if you really want to do it, if there's anything else you can do, please do it. Yeah. If you have to paint, if you have to make stuff, you feel compelled. If you feel compelled to make stuff, mm. and and yes, it is heartbreaking. And if you, but if you, if you, your worth in the making only comes because you sell it. That's not enough. That's not enough. Because you no. can actually make saleable things that are not your passion. Yeah. In other words, you you can. But that is. I don't want to say prostitute your art, but you can do something that you know is going to sell, sell, sell. Yeah, but that is a dilemma because some people, like even artists, need to survive. You do need to survive. Teaching yeah. used to be the way that we could all do it. Yeah. That you could could. Um, and workshops are still the way that 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 you can still, if you if you um, need to get money. But I but suppose opening up your studio, your home, or getting together with a few artists and having little exhibitions in sort of maybe low key places, you know, just doing your due diligence, you know, because sitting at home and creating on your own for time indefinite is. Could be demotivating, you know. When a person buys your painting, it's very inspiring because you feel, oh, somebody wants my oh, it's work true. on their wall, even if you don't sell it for a high value. Absolutely, it's a very, it's a very like motivating thing to spur you on to keep at it in a way. So it, it's quite difficult. I know that a lot, a lot of young artists really struggle and have to do alternative things to earn an income. I think that's pretty well always been there. I mean, you, you know, and, and there's some artists that are better at promoting their art. I mean, Irma Stern was not, was not um, wonderfully recognized in her own life. I mean, goodness me, half of art history is by people, I mean, the Monets and the, and the Van Goghs and the, all of them. I mean, e even like Piero della Francesca from the, from the Renaissance wasn't really, really recognized except in some little village called San Sepulcro San Borgo. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and then years later he's dug up by Cezanne for some way. You know, and you think, but same it's made. It, it, it's, it is the passion and it's the kind of belief system. Whatever your belief system is, it's some kind of way that there's something beyond you yeah. that drives you beyond money. Yeah. And, and I think that's, mm -hmm. and that's this, what I would say. Yes, that brings me to the next question. You have a huge amount of reference to the Bible. I loved your reference to the Twelve Apostles at the long table in your exhibition at Spoon Street with the goblets and all the messages, all the messages, some people would pick them up and some people might not pick up what your whole uh, narrative and agenda is. Are you also giving small messages to people or is it just what naturally comes when you make your art? So in other words, do you ever sit down and say, I'm going to create this and I hope it inspires one person? Or is it just made from what inspiration comes to you, not with the intention of giving out a message about the Bible or not necessarily to create, get people to follow a religion, but I found a lot of messages in your work. 
I think I think the the thing with with the family. I think what more and more. I mean, I'm working on now um, a a series. I always work in a series mm. called Gratitude. Yes. And I think that that it's you know. I mean, there's that that Jesus parable about the loaves and the fishes. Yeah. And that little guy just was brought his sandwiches. Yeah. And and in some way these are my sandwiches. Yes, 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 yes. They so, can multiply by themselves. Well, well the thing mm. is, um, there are just bits of clay and bits of paper and bits of weaving that actually unless they are touched, unless somebody responds to something, yeah. then then um there are just bits of clay. Yes. And yes. bits of whatever. Yes. But I think I'm, in old age you get more and more grateful. Yeah. You you, you 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 realize that actually you have been spared so much. Mm. You have been um, given delight in making, whether it sells or not. Yes. You have you have still got hands that can make things. Yeah. Maybe they're smaller. Maybe they're not um, four meter pictures or what they are. Mm. Um, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's just like every day is somehow a gift. It is a gift. But uh, you say they're just pieces of clay, but actually you're, you have a particular kind of a DNA that runs through all of your work. And it is that texture, it is that uh, nature, natural, organic, very hand-touched, hand-felt uh, a look and feel to absolutely everything you do, including all the paper that you make and all your beautiful textile art which even the simplest one I find is absolutely beautiful. So, you know, you can't say that it's just pieces of clay. This is much more than that. Well, you see, I think clay is also part of the whole sacred deal. Yes. That, that, that actually bread and clay and a family meal is in kind of a last supper. Yeah. It's, it's, it's everything that we, we touch, whether you, you're a, a believer or not, yeah. that you can, in fact, in infuse yeah. every 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 um the earth we work you know yes. you can go for a walk um you know on a on a rainy day like this mm. and the plants everything the will smells. somehow mm. will somehow be sacred yes. somehow that they will be like that that the clay you have had the delight to make mm. um is simply just clay. Yeah. So what you've done, you've written some of your story on some of it, and so all, because I taught art history for a while, I'm sort of a little bit impacted about all those his, those old pillars from the Romans. In those days, mm. they didn't teach all art discourse like they do at UNISA now mm. and at uh, Michaelis. They taught art history. That was from the caves um, to modern day through the yeah. uh, through everywhere through, through the, the Egyptians through that the, you just yeah. went so all that stuff gets embedded mm. so when you do you're quoting bits maybe quite cuckoo bits occasionally yes. I mean here's an, an, uh, an arm that just comes out yeah. and I there's so many hands so many arms and so many wonderful works of art that feed another generation, yes. that feed so another generation. On that note of the body parts, um, you spent quite a bit of time in the 50s as a nurse at Puerto School Hospital. Well, not quite a bit of time. I came from Isn't a medical... Was about two years or a couple of years? No. Well, it's exactly 18 months. Okay, well, that's um, a lot of time to me. <laughs> yes. I... I uh, you seem to But it was really, very very important because we got real bones to okay. to to uh, be allowed to take home to work from mm -hmm. when you went to college yes. so so my first drawing was really some of those bones okay um but did that I didn't influence the way you saw the human body oh absolutely i mean my early work is very much about stains and i was highly influenced shortly after i qualified by the art povera movement in Italy. What a tell us uh, um, Alberto Burri who burnt canvases, who 
patched up old bits and pieces. We did things like that. Uh, what, is the, what is it called? The art? Uh, art povera, povera. Which means poor art, you know, like art of poverty. Yeah. And and um I really love that. And so 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 the one that's in the in the Johannesburg gallery is has got burnt holes in which, which they bought fairly soon after I qualified. And um, you know, stitching that gets uh, long bits of string and things, and then the early, uh, what, the 1985 at, at the Johannesburg Gallery is, was was also um, very much art povera in some things, although it was paper. Paper was, for me, I thought I was signing up to do weaving, and, and once I had threaded those big college things, I, I changed to paper. Yes, yes. Can I ask you something else? Yes. Um, I wanted to find out, you, you did that new thing, but then you went on to study teaching, and you actually became a lecturer at the art of song. Well, yes, I had In several... In Johannesburg? Had, yes, I, I, I did, did several teaching things. I always wanted to do art, but coming from a medical family, that, that I think my mother had something... We did. Have, she did give a few to the church faith. She had Tina's Beyond Etchings, and she had a, a rather lovely piece with uh, a, a still life and poppies. And that was like my art education yeah. at primary school. Go to. Yes, <laughs> and I did make, I did make um, chewing gum. I mean, from a medical family, this is not a good story. Um, I, I chewed up every body in my classes chewing gum, and I made these very spastic um, ballerinas. <laughs> So that was my early art yes. education. Okay. And then so you went on, you became a lecturer, and what was the subject of your thesis? Hmm. It was called Logos as Artifact. It came in two volumes, and, and um, Greg Carr and Willem Bossoff, who I did it with, um, said it could, be, it could be salvaged in a flood because it was bound in, in plastic, although it was handmade drawings and everything in it. And Kathy helped me. In those days, you had to cut a tranny you remember? for each page. A tranny for each page. Then we, we shrunk that and, and made that bigger and smaller. And it was a work of um, Jack Ginsburg. I, I donated it to Jack Ginsburg. Jack Ginsburg, well, that really brings back um, memories. And yes, and it... The colours all came out because this is early. What was that printing? That printing that you get made now that that does colours. Well, it was the early thing. I paid fortune to get them done, but the pale greys came out deep purple. So this whole book, I said to Jack, if you get the real picture ever, it's never going to look anything like what you see here. He didn't seem to mind. So just in summing up, what I would like to say, what I would like to just say about you and your work and your amazing history that you've shared with us in this exhibition, is for me, as, an, as a viewer, yeah. I find that your work has a timeless appeal. It appeals to all generations. It appeals to all types of people, from the contemporary to the traditional. You know, there's nothing in your collection, in all your work, that one, they would, anyone would walk in and they would find something they love which is not what you can say for many artists, because many artists get very stuck in a look and feel, and that's all they reproduce. So, and I mean, I see it myself a lot. So, you know, you can identify that person's work, and yes, obviously one can identify your work. But I find out of the bigger names in South African artist, artists, I find that Elizabeth Bell's art has a very timeless and broad appeal, real broad appeal. So, I mean, what was really lovely is one of the young women that worked in the hotel now was wanting to buy one of your vessels. So it just shows, you know, you'd even get a, a young person straight out of school that wants to start an art collection. And the other lovely thing that I love is that you have work that eclipses all price ranges. You've got work that's affordable and you've got work that's in the hundred odd thousand. So it's not as though a person wanting to start a collection and wanting to start buying Elizabeth Bell's 
needs to be in the mini. You can actually come with a thousand rand or so and start a collection of person in your league. I think it's an incredible thing because a lot of artists are just out of everyone's reach. So, yeah, congratulations to you for keeping it real, keeping it well, humble, keeping it modest. The exhibition that you did with Kathy at the little gallery in uh, Cork Bay was magnificent. I think you really had a great reaction to that. So, yeah, keep going, Liz. We hope that you're going to be part of a lot more of these type of exhibitions in the future. Thank you for that. But I thank you. I have a very supportive family in Kathy and Joshua, yeah. who, who is a Michaela's graduate, who's yeah. used her son, my grandson. Yes, and you're an art family. So, so I... I have kept up to every graduate show, everything, so I, I know what's being produced now, which was such a gift yeah. to be able to, yeah. to, to be a viewer yeah. of the coming, what, well, is, what is Scott maybe, called? Maybe, maybe the Gorgeous George can do a, a family exhibition for your family, like on a bigger scale than what you had in Cork Bay, you know, we can talk to the influencers like Janelle and Terence, and maybe that could be something you can, we can set as a goal for next year. You know, I mean, it is a beautiful venue. It is a beautiful and, venue. And thank you for coming. And well, thank you for being here okay. today. Uh, yes, and forgive me for over-talking everything. No, you must talk. That's what you have <laughs> to do. That's what we, we want to know. And so, we're going to close up now, wind up. Right. But thank you so much, and Kathy, for bringing Liz and... For yes. supporting, you've actually. I, mean, I wouldn't be on it. Instagram. I wouldn't be anywhere yeah. actually without Kathy. Do I just make the stuff? Well, <laughs> you would be, but no, she's exactly, just taken you to exactly. another level. I mean, that Thanks. exhibition in Spin Street was incredible. Mm. I, mean, I just wish more people would have seen it. Well, you, you know, I, I actually think I still the gratitude thing sums it up. I am grateful to God that I'm still here, still able to do that, and for all those long list of things would never have happened. Yes, no, so I agree. I, I 